uh, very funny part. Psalms 143. Turn with me to Psalms 40, 143 today. I want to share with you um, the life of David as he was being pursued by his son Absalom. The Vulgate, that Vulgate Bible tells us. Many of you may have a Bible that has some heading, maybe a Psalms of David or a Destitute, Psalms of David, something like that. But Psalms is, is a, a multiple listing of various artists and various songs that were written out in word forms that we can glean from them today. Some of them are uplifting, some of them face individuals who have discouragement. And, and, uh, today, I want to kind of, matter of fact, uh, Carolyn, who's with her mother today, and by the way, Wayne Bridges is in Rocky Mount. Uh, here right now. He's uh, uh, doing better song yesterday. He's sitting up to look good. He had the jeans on, sports jeans, and I mean his tennis shoes. So he was really doing well. Mark, it's good to see you here today. It really is. I know it's been very difficult. And we love you and praying for you. Miss Sandy DeWolf is still uh, uh, battling the heart for heart being out of rhythm, and, and so she's at home. And yesterday was not having too good of a day, so continue to pray for uh, Miss Sandy as well. A lot of folks in our church have been battling things. Remember, if you don't have anything to pray for, so many opportunities there with you. Miss Carolyn is with her mother today. As some of you know, her mother was in a care facility, and they had water damage through the snowstorm, and so they had to uh, move her to uh, Jackie's uh, and Carolyn's house, and they're looking after her for a while. So a lot of things are going on right now. We just need your prayers. Go to your but today the message is really, I, I, I told you that to tell you, yesterday I was here at church and I was working, and I sent Carolyn a message because I always send them the messages early, and so, okay, this is the PowerPoint, this is what, you know, goes on, on the screens, but I, we changed it yesterday, so next week I'm going to speak, I'm going to be speaking on you, there's no such thing as Christian unemployment. I'm going to talk to you about that next week and how you can be of service to God in 2018. But today I want to kind of direct this message, not just towards Parker, but to every man and woman in this church who faces good and bad times. In the first part of Psalms uh, 143, we see the complaint. David is telling you how difficult things are and, and how he just feels like getting up. And I know we've been there before, but beginning with verse number 7, we're going to pick up today. It says, Come quickly, Lord, and answer me, for my depression deep. Don't turn away from me, or I will die. This introduces a prayer. And he says, I'm going through a difficult time. Just by showing me. How many of you have ever been through a difficult time? Raise your hand. Look at that. You're never alone. Let me hear of your unfailing love each morning, for I'm trusting you. Show me where to walk, for I give myself to you. That's what we just did. Parker stood here and he said, the Lord, I'm committing myself to your service. We prayed over him that, that commitment to send him forth. He's given himself over to the Lord. Rescue me from my enemies, Lord. I, I run to you to hide. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your gracious spirit lead me forth on a firm footing. For the glory of your name, O oh Lord, preserve my life. Because of your faithfulness, bring me out of this distress. Now, don't get me wrong. Parker's not in some depression right now that we need to get him out of. Okay? <laughs> He's not. But every one of us have common ground that we've been discouraged in some way. As I was talking to our Sunday school class this morning, I shared with them that the Christian life is not easy. You do realize that now, right? If you haven't, surprise. The Christian life is not an easy life, and it's a difficult life. And that is why Christ, in His teachings, that is why throughout the canon of Scripture from old to new, it compares the life of Christ to several tedious tasks, grueling races, a battlefield, a, a wrestling match. It's a very difficult life, but it is one that can be experienced to the fullest only by abiding in Christ. And David was a man after God's own heart and he had seen his own family turn inside out and it destroyed not, him, not only physically the kingdom, but it destroyed him spiritually. It destroyed him emotionally. He cries out to God. And Parker, in some sense, what you just went through, I mean, you really not changed. You didn't all, all of a sudden take a different look and, and you know, he, when you came into church this morning, you're, you're going to walk out different other than in the eyes of the state and the Southern Baptist Convention, you're an ordained pastor. That certificate certifies that. But you're, you're really the same person. You're really the same person that serves the Lord, that loves the Lord, that serves His people. The, the process of ordination, it does mean to, to set apart or to send forth. At, at 
Acts chapter 7, it says that Joseph was ordained as a ruler in Egypt. Uh, in Matthew 24, the, the steward of Jesus' parable, he was ordained to oversee the household. He was set apart to do these things. In Acts 6, the deacons were ordained to serve in the church. In Titus 1, 5, pastors were ordained. So there's different terms in which we see the word ordained in the Bible. But in one sense, every one of you have been ordained for the cause of Christ. When you come to know the Lord as your personal Savior, see, we've got to get past the church as far as the political side of it. We've got to get past the church as far as the traditional side of it, and they all have their place. We've got to get to the church with the relationship side of it. Jesus did not die to elevate you to a political status. He did not die to elevate you to a traditional position. He died so that He might have an intimate relationship. And the sinfulness of my heart could be redeemed to the cross by His work alone to a holy God. So let's talk today about what David's cry, what his prayer was. He said, God, you're my God. And I absolutely need you. I want to give you just a few points before I see you home today. Number one, all of us, all of us, not just Parker, but every one of us, we need to have a desire for God to hear us. I want God to hear me. When I call out to God, I want God to hear my prayers. If I were to ask you today, how many of you, when you pray, you want God to hear what you have to say? I believe everybody would raise their hand. Some of you have been bombarding heaven so much recently on behalf of a, of a, a sick relative or someone you care about or, or a very difficult situation. You have been praying and seeking God's face and you want to hear God. Now sometimes the truth is we don't feel like it, right? Have there been times in your life, have there been times in your life when you prayed and prayed and you felt like your prayers were just going as far as the roof and then kind of falling back down? That's human nature. That's our sinful nature. Yeah, we do feel that way sometimes. David cried out to God in verse number 7 that he wanted to come, come quickly, Lord. Answer me. I want you to hear me. My depression, it deepens. What should one desire for God to hear? Can I tell you one of the most difficult prayers, but the perfect prayer is, Lord, let your will be done. See, oftentimes we pray and we're upset because the answer doesn't come. At least we don't think it comes like we want it to come, but in reality it does. It's just not what we want. I have come to understand in the years of preaching and teaching that my will is not always in harmony with God. And even though sometimes I don't understand God's will, I learn so much through His will, and His will always turns out to be right. Isn't that crazy? David said, God, I want you to hear me, but understand this. David knew in the Old Testament, we teach it in the Old and New Testament, that sin will hinder our prayers. Please make no mistake about it. If we are participating actively with no regard to remove the sin, it hinders our prayers. Some of you today, I can ask, and I won't do that because you would probably hurt me. I would ask you to stand up and quote your first verse in your discipleship program. And that first, well, not the first verse, excuse me, the first verse uh, is Joshua. I would ask you to stand up and quote Isaiah 59 too. And Isaiah 59 says that the hand of the Lord is not short, that He can't reach out and touch you, and His ears are not stopped up, that He cannot hear. But what separates us and God? Sin. Sin puts a barrier between us and God. And we're not talking about these great big grotesque sins that we have to push in the closet. We're talking about the sins as we talked about two Wednesday nights ago. Not only of commission, but omission. The things we know we should do and we don't do it. Those are sin. James tells us in chapter 4 verse 17, remember it's a sin to know what you should do and not do it. So David had a long in and Parker, I want to tell you, in your ministry, never stop desiring to hear or for God to hear you. Never stop praying. One of the things we often do, and I say we, not you, not me, but we, we oftentimes pray in difficult situations. But as things begin to smooth out, our prayer life begins to cease in the area of importance. Please think about what I'm saying. Something goes wrong in our life and we want to pray and gather everybody around us to pray. But when things begin to work out, we're not as focused on communication with God. Barbara, as David had a desire for God to hear him, I ask, I charge, I pray that everything you do in ministry, before you do it, you have a desire that God 
that he hears you before you do so. Every plan, every action, every being, saturate in prayer and ask God to lead you before you participate. The second thing found here in verse 8, he had a desire for God to guide. I'll read verse 8 to you again. It says, let me hear of your unfailing love each morning. For I'm trusting you. Show me where to walk. God guide me. I'm not going to ask you, but I can tell you from my own experience, there have been so many decisions that I have made that had I spent time praying and seeking God's face before I made them, I would have suffered a lot less hurt. You know, oftentimes what we do is we already make up our mind. We do the deed and then we pray for God's blessings. It's like going to the car dealership and you're signing the paper and saying, Lord, if it's your will, let me know. <laughs> if not, God, I won't put this period right here, but okay, God, I, I, you know, we're, we're, what, what are we doing? I'm talking about things from relationships to buying a home, to buying a car, to a job, to the most simple things of God. Today, what is your plan for me? Listen, I love my children. There's nothing that can change that. Honest to goodness, I love them. Yes, they aggravate me to death sometimes, but I still love them. And I care about my children. I want what's best for Bryce. And I want what's best for Reagan. I really and truly do want what's best for them. And if the Bible says if I have that desire for my children, how much more does God in heaven have the desire to watch over, direct, and send us down what would be the best path? David had a need, and he realized that he could not do without God's guidance. The one time he stepped out on his own, Psalms 51 was instituted shortly thereafter when he said, God restored to me the joy of my salvation because he was somewhere where he shouldn't have been, doing what he shouldn't have done instead of doing what he should be doing. And he failed. You look at David, and David prayed before he brought the ark back. He prayed before he went into battle. He stood before the giant as he came onto the world's surface, and he says, I come at you in the name of the Lord. He always sought the guidance of God. And Parker, my encouragement to you today, and I'm telling you from personal experience, before you leave, seek God's guidance. I want to tell you, husbands, wives, moms, and dads, college career teenagers, please don't think you're too young or too old to seek God's guidance. Before you make your decisions, ask your Father who loves you more than you could ever fathom. Ask God what His desire is for you. Lord, simply guide me. Number three, very simple. In verses 9 and 12, He had a desire for God to deliver Verse 9, the New Living Translation, he used the word rescue. In verse 12, he says, Silence, silence my enemies. Free me from my enemies. What is the need here? As I, as I said before, we're family. We are a family. We should be always be a family, but you know, the family do, families do work. And there's going to be times in the ministry, I can tell you, personal experience is a way that there's going to be times in the ministry you're going to want just a little time. There's going to be times in your Christian life where you're going to want to quit because you've invested in the people and you love certain people so much. Maybe as a Sunday school teacher, maybe as a deacon, maybe as a, a children's worker, you invest and you invest and you pour and you give yourself and then you feel like they have betrayed you or they've hurt you and you just feel so empty and discouraged. <laughs> You're going to want to throw in the towel. You're going to want to quit. You're going to say, I give up. It's during those times. I want to encourage you to go to Paul told the church at Corinth, he says, I beg you to begin what you, to finish what you saw. So many times we in churches, we as believers, we start a lot of things and we don't finish it. Going to Planet Fitness, I hate January. <laughs> Do you know why I despise January kind of business? Because everybody gets a new membership in January. And everybody goes, I have to wait about mid-February before we can get back to normality again. But everybody has these resolutions. So many people start off saying, I'm going to pray this year, and I'm going to be in church, and I'm going to read the Bible, and I'm going to bury the hatchet, and I'm going to stop doing this, and I'm going to start doing that. And we start off so strong, and then we stop. And 
unfortunately, in the reality of things, we are raising today a generation of quitters. We really are. If you don't like it, quit. If you don't like dance, quit. If you don't like gymnastics, quit. If you don't like baseball, quit. If you don't like... I mean, we teach that and say it's okay, but what we need to show through our own examples is whatever we start, we finish it. Sometimes through difficulties. The sad reality is that some of us, myself included, we've quit from God. We got mad, hurt, wounded, Upset. We decided I don't even know what's the use. Mark, I promise you this, and it sounds gloomy, but there's going to be times you But as David said, he said, Lord, free me from my enemies. Free me from those who are. He was a king. He had complete authority. Yet he recognized the only way he could be free was to be crazy. Because during those times, even though you may not feel like it, even though maybe you may not want to, I encourage you to find your place in home with God. And sometimes the moments of 26 says those not words. We just say, God, I need you. And the Lord has the ability not only to hear you, but He has the ability. Number four, we found in verse 10. I've only got one more making it for We should have a desire for God to teach us. Teach me to do your will. For you are my God. May your gracious spirit lead me forward on a firm footing. I'm learning, man. I'm still learning. Andrew, you're learning. Ron is back there with the children. He had to run back to the children. He's learning. Parker, you're learning. We're all learning together. Last week, we spent all day just in meetings going back and forth. It was really funny because we, we had to find a quiet place. We went to a little restaurant coffee shop down the road and and every mother in that town brought their child there that day. And, and I mean, honestly, I kid you not when I say in one serious conversation, a ball came to get Ron on the side of the hill. Tell me, it's Ron and not myself. But that was kind of the day we had. And, and we were very serious about it. But, you know, we came up with a lot of plans that we're going to pray and we're going to talk about. We're going to introduce a lot of great things to you this upcoming year. But you know the main thing this church needs? You know the main thing I need? The main thing you need is to realize that we never start learning that we do not know everything, and that God always has something to teach us. Lord, what do you want me to know? Listen, every person is unique. Every person is different. We have the opportunity when we meet someone to grow to get to know something new and different about somebody. Take that opportunity. The only person you can't teach is the person who knows everything. Have you ever met someone like that? Don't nudge anybody, please. No little fight started. You know, there's, there's people who know everything and you can't teach them anything. But if you've got a willingness to learn, to, a willingness to acknowledge, yes, I have made mistakes, I've, I've failed, I've done wrong this time. Learn. Take every opportunity to learn. David said, teach me. Spirit guide me. That is a, a forecast of Ephesians. When Paul says, uh, be not drunk with wine wherein it is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. The word drunk or be filled means to submit yourself daily. So Paul was saying that every day the Christian must submit himself or herself to the Holy Spirit's guidance. So today's submission will get you through today, but tomorrow you must reaffirm and say, Lord, what do you have for me today? It's not a once and for all thing. It's a daily submission. And David is saying, God, I'm king. I'm a man after your own heart. You have blessed me with infinite wisdom. Not quite like my son, but you've blessed me. But God, teach me. What a powerful statement. How does God teach us today? Very quick. I'll give you a hint. What? Good job. Yeah, the Bible. God teaches us through the Bible. Now here's the key. If He teaches us through the Bible, but we're not reading the Bible. What is the result? We're not learning. If you think, if I think that I can survive just by being here on Sunday mornings or Wednesday nights, I am fooling myself. A relationship with God is an investment in daily communication with God. Teach me God. Tuesday, if my wife decides to stay here with me, I'll be married for 25 years. Honestly, I am still learning things. I am. My son is 18, my daughter is 20. I am still learning things. Teach me, God. 
and I'm willing to listen. And then the last thing is found in verse 11. God revived. The word revive means to restore or to repair or to give life back. As I shared with you earlier, Parker, you know this, I'm sure already, there'll be times in your ministry where you're tired, where you're worn out, when you're hurt, when you're discouraged. David called out to God and he said, Lord, revive me. Bring life back to me. Give me the strength. Give me that energy again. And I want to encourage you and I want to encourage everyone of you here today. There are times you're going to be on the spirit of God. And you're going to be just so excited about serving God. And there are going to be times where you're going to have to push yourself to do just that. When you get to those points in your life where you're struggling and you can barely make it through. When you feel like just like I said earlier, throwing in the towel. Pray. Seek the face of God. Hold on to the garment. Say, God, revive me. Bring the life back to me. There have been times I didn't want to preach. There have been times I didn't want to sing. There have been times I have just fought getting out of bed in the morning. But it's during those times that I cry out to one who has created me, who strengthens me, who loves me. God, help me. And you know what? He is amazing because He loves me. But in spite of my condition, He loves me enough to do just that. Revive me, David said. Yes, I have ultimate authority. Yes, I am King. Yes, I am one of the greatest psalmists, but God, I need you to bring life back to me where my life seems to be fading out. None of us are superhuman. None of us are above this. And when we get to those points in our life where we just can't go anymore, cry out to God. Oftentimes, we'll call someone on our, on our privilege. We'll, we'll pick up the phone and say, hey, pray for me. And there's nothing wrong with that, and I encourage you to do that. But do you know if you call me and say, preacher, pray for me, I will do that, but that's the greatest thing I can do is pray for you. I can't change the situation, but when you call out to God, He can. And I'm just what a, a practical thought here. It is great to ask others to help you. It is great to ask others to stand with you in the Bible. But don't forget to seek the one who can make the difference when you're down. Seek His face. Oh God, you're my God. And I need you. I told you today I changed it yesterday just a very simple message. One that we all truly learn from because we're going to get to those points in our lives. Never stop learning. When you feel like the way to keep on. When your soul feels crushed and ask God to revive you. And it's not because we deserve it but because He loves us. Would you value it? Let's pray.
say, God, revive me. I'm tired. I feel like I can't go on anymore. God, revive me. Bring about that, re that revitalization of my spirit. Lord, let me seek to live again. Not just live, but live for you. The prayer of David could be our prayer today. I want to pray for you. When I finish praying, I'm going to ask you to keep your seat. We've got five people to present to you today for membership. Father, we come to you. And I, I just, your word is always capable of teaching something new. God, even the little children in jam time and we jam, they, they understand it. They can teach us. But Lord, we can read it every day and never master it. That's the awesomeness of your word, God. And Lord, today, the prayer of David when he was in distress, Lord, should be our plan, our prayer, that you would guide us, deliver us, teach us, forgive us, restore us, hear us, Lord Jesus, if we can apply these to our lives, whatever the circumstance is, to know that everything we face is still under your authority. Father, I thank you today for allowing us to ordained as a church, as a body, into the Christian service, Parker French. And I pray for your blessings upon him. he and his wife, that God you would continue to use him in a mighty way. And God, as David said, you are my God. And there's no doubt I need you. In Jesus, your name alone we pray. Amen.